Hi, everybody. Some of you I know, some of you are new faces. Um, we used to host the Woodworkers Guild at my studio back in the day. And we'll have a couple slides related to that. If you don't mind, I am going to sit because I've been on my feet teaching all day. So my legs are achy at this point. But that, can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Okay, awesome. Okay, so I'm going to give some, some history, how I got into my career, what I do now. Um, so I grew up in Michigan, came out here for school, actually. That's me on the far right as a little kid. And you'll notice I look a lot like my dad. Um, I grew up down the street from Cranbrook. Um, it's a school and a museum that's located in Brookfield, Michigan. Um, definitely a heavy influence for me growing up, being near such a unique uh, collection of design and art. Um, another big influence for me was the DIA, Detroit Institute of Art, that has an amazing collection. If you ever have a chance, if you're ever out in the Detroit area, I highly recommend going ahead and taking a, a visit to the DIA. Um, in high school, I did not have any art program. <clears throat> so I had to take after school classes to go ahead and get my creativity out. And the one that resonated with me the most was jewelry design. Um, so I developed a portfolio of jewelry work. This is one of the pieces that I was most proud of at the time. Um, I was actually looking at colleges for engineering, and it's my uncle who lives in the Boston area who uh, convinced me to come look at RISD. Um, and I came out and I took a look. It was during finals. It was raining. Everybody was grouchy. I said, there's no way I'm ever going here. <laughs> this is the worst experience. He was like, it was the wrong time. You got to come back. I think it was like four months later, he convinced me to come out again. <clears throat> timed it well. A sunny day, beginning of the semester, I fell in love with it. Um, so I actually applied to RISD as one of the only art school I applied to. Everything else was engineering. Um, and I applied to RISD for jewelry at the time. That's what I had developed. That's what I was into. Um, here is a picture. I'm in the center there when I was at RISD. This is 18 years ago now. Um, I threw in a couple little sayings here. Don't wait for an opening. Create it yourself. Um, after I graduated from RISD, I wanted to go straight into furniture design. I didn't know how I was going to do it. I didn't know what I was going to do. Um, but I had had an internship at a place called Maria Yi that does production furniture. And she had a lot of connections in the industry and introduced me to people at Room and Board and Crate and Barrel. And I got my foot in there doing some freelance design work pretty much right out of school. Um, I then added Magnolia and Best Buy to work I was doing, and I'm going to show you some images of work I developed under that. Um, so this was for Crate and Barrel. This is a piece that they still produce. I didn't do it exclusive. Just, I didn't do it just me. It was on a team of three people that I was working with. So bouncing ideas around the table, developing kind of the contour and the lines that we were looking for. They wanted a completely leather chair. Um, you know, there's a tradition in furniture making of these completely leather chairs uh, through the early to mid um, uh, 19, what is it, 1920s to 1960s that was really popular, and they wanted to go ahead and bring that to a larger market. Um, I then got asked by Ruben Ford, who was, I was also doing work for, who was a competitor of Crate and Barrel. Hey, we love that leather chair you did. Could you do a leather chair for us? They also still produce this chair. They're competitors that produce this chair and sell it side by side, which is wonderful. Unfortunately, I did this as a flat fee, not as royalties. I should have done it for royalties because I'd still be making money today off of it. Um, but they did a version that was a chair and a stool. Um, and I included this slide as a point that in the industry, when you design something, it's not always made the way in the end that you designed it. So what I actually designed is on the left there. What they produced is on the right. So you can see there was quite a few changes that got made between the design and the development of the design and when it actually went to production. And there's that time frame there between marketing, cost of manufacturing, uh, different iterations where I had no involvement in. So I don't necessarily see it when I design it from the point I kind of submit the final design to when it comes out in the marketplace. What's that leather covering? 
Um, it's a, a metal framework. Okay. It's a metal framework. The spray adhered some foam onto it in certain areas. Um, most of the sewing is done off of the form, but then the final touches where it all comes together is so done right on the form. No stretchers on that chair. Exactly, because it's all metal, metal framework. Exactly, not uh, woodwork. Um, here's some shots in context of the pieces. Context says a lot to people as to where it should be used and how it should be used, and I'll go into that a bit more when I get to my, my work that I've done through my studio. Um, make a plan, then make another plan. So in 2008, I came back to, late 2008, I came back to Rhode Island. Um, it was during a time that Crate and Barrel got rid of their in-house prototyping and went completely to CAD. And I thought there was a huge loss in the design process when I couldn't design with my hands. And so I came back to Rhode Island, I was in California at the time, and I said to some buddies of mine, what if we start a little kind of garage shop in a place that we can keep tinkering with our hands? Uh, for some of us, it was going to be a career opportunity. For others, it was going to be a hobbyist opportunity. Um, this was 2008. I had taken out a small loan so that I could be part of this, and most of my buddies were had savings they were, were falling back on to do it. Um, I had taken out a $20,000 loan for my part. The market crashed a couple weeks later. Um, so this was early 2008, actually, now that I'm thinking about it. Um, market crashed a couple weeks later. I had this money. I hadn't spent it yet. I had a hard decision to make. Was I going to kind of return it or still pursue this in a terrible market? Meanwhile, all of the buddies, I had five buddies. There were six of us total that were going to go on on this. We're like, Ugh, can't go ahead and do it. Can't put my savings into it right now, very understandably. So what ended up happening is I spent the 20000 uh covering the first month or two of rent and purchasing machinery, and they became renters of mine rather than investors. So I went from thinking I would be a co-owner to being a sole proprietor uh, very quickly. So this was our first shop. This was in the Hope Artiste Village, if anybody's been there. We were like the third or fourth tenant to move in. Um, this was a bay that they built out for us because prior to this, the whole side of the building was open all the way from the front to the back. And so they were subdividing it and, and putting in you know, some upfront uh, electrical work for us to go ahead and move into that space. Um, within a year of being in this space, we decided some additional income would be helpful and we started teaching classes. And that was the birth of Kise Studio. So some of you have, you know, were involved in Kise Studio back in the day. Um, <clears throat> next slide. You won't be amazing at the start, but you're amazing for starting. <laughs> um, so in this space, you know, I had some more hair at that point in time. Um, I had been doing a year or two of commission work, um, kind of chasing commission work, trying to find where the next job was coming from. I obviously had taken out this loan, I needed to pay back this loan. So I was doing front doors, I was doing kitchens, I was doing repair work, I was not doing a lot of design work that was exciting. Um, so I was tinkering in whatever free time I had with developing my own line of work at that point in time. And, and people that came to the shop, either people we had invited to or people taking classes, um, commented on it. And I got a lot of feedback and kind of refined the designs based on that feedback. Um, this was 2010, um, I was going to go to the fine furnishing show. It was a rather contemporary body of work. I went as a participant just to, you know, walk through the show and I overheard this lady looking at the one contemporary exhibitor there saying, what, do they think we live on a spaceship or something? And I realized <laughs> my work would not fit well or get the attention it needed in that setting. <laughs> and I was very discouraged. I didn't know what I was going to do with this body of work. And it was my parents that actually pushed me to do the International Contemporary Furniture Fair at the Javits Center in New York, which was way over my head, a much bigger show. Um, but their mentality was, if you're going to give this a try, go big or go home. you got to get it out there. you got to get it in front of the right people. Um, it was $4,000 for a six-foot by six-foot booth. Very oh, tiny food. Oh, yeah, it's very costly. Um, they, my parents lent me the money. I did not have four thousand dollars sitting around. They lent me the money. Um, you know, they were kind of of the same mentality that like you, you got to do this. We'll help you do it. We'll get you out there. Um, 
I was very fortunate that I had 10 editor editors that came together and had voted on uh, different categories that year. And I got best new designer um, for the work that I brought that year. And so I ended up, this is the work I produced and brought that year. I ended up in 10 different magazines and publications. I uh, really launched my career. I didn't have to think about marketing for the first year or two because I got so much coverage from that. Um, going back to those context images I showed you, um, I thought it'd be really cool to name all these pieces after Rhode Island places and photograph them in Rhode Island places and quickly learn that the downside of that is you get a lot of phone calls from people saying, hey, does this, can this go in an outdoor setting? Um, and no, none of it was designed to be outdoor and I had shown it in an outdoor context and had to quickly reshoot and put out images that showed it in an indoor context. Um, so although I love these images, um, you know, wasn't able to go ahead and do that again. Um, I also launched a couple pieces of lighting that year, or, or just these, you know, two pieces of lighting um, that I named the Cumberland Lights. Um, here's some of the publications, uh, Craft Magazine, New York Times, um, uh, just a whole bunch of different stuff, and it was a, a great opportunity to launch my career. Um, don't panic, adapt. So I, of course, got back from this show. I had developed these new pieces. I didn't know how I was going to produce them in quantity. Um, you know, I had made a handful of them through prototyping. And, you know, you're young and you, you say, oh, that little technique, that takes five minutes, no big deal. And that technique, that takes five minutes, no big deal. And then you get your first order for 40 stools, and all of a sudden it adds up to hours and hours and hours for that little thing that you consider to be not a big deal. Um, I had always had a love for jigs, but this is where I could really exercise that love. And, you know, developed and built quite a few jigs to go ahead and, and produce these pieces. Within a couple of weeks, uh, hired my first employee, um, and you know, things took off from there. It's not failure; it's data. <laughs> so I tinkered with some accessories, small tabletop type things. These were inspired by oyster shells. It's kind of a geometric version of an oyster shell. These are cast brass. Um, I had built a relationship while I was at RISD with a local foundry, um, Harrison Casting. Um, they're in, where are they? I'm blanking on where they are. Johnson. They're in Johnson, Rhode Island. Um, they're wonderful to work with if you're ever looking for somebody to cast things. They will do small one-off stuff, so if you ever are tinkering with making hardware for furniture, want to carve it out of wax, bring them a wax. They use a technique called lost box, lost wax casting. Yeah, where you go ahead and you have a, a wax that they attach to a base or a tree of, of components. They go ahead and they cast it in plaster. After the plaster dries, you melt the wax out and now you have a cavity that was the shape of your wax. You, melt, you uh, melt the bronze or brass, whatever it is you're casting with, you pour it into that cavity, and as it's cooling, you break away that plaster, and now you have a positive you know, brass or bronze or whatever material you're casting. Um, so going back to, it's not, it's not failure, I think it was, it's data, these did not take off. I really loved developing these. I really liked carving these, because the first couple were carved. What are Sorry? What part of it? Like little change dishes, you know, little oh, dishes okay. that could sit on a tabletop, um, just interesting shapes that I was exploring. Um, the outside contour is different than the inside contour, so the wall thickness is variable throughout. Um, another piece that I did that didn't take off but got a lot of attention was this piece, which I named the Corliss Chair. The back part is actually cast aluminum. Um, it's hollow cast aluminum. Um, I had created a master form, worked with an aluminum foundry up in Marlboro, Mass, that made templates for it and were able to pull castings from it. Um, I loved this piece. I thought it was neat to interpret, reinterpret kind of a wood vernacular into aluminum. Um, this piece still gets us the most attention on Pinterest. Even though we it was a poor seller for us, even though we don't produce it anymore, even though we don't produce furniture anymore, this still, you know, the several images of this still outperform, outperforms everything for us. So it just goes to show. Um, that is a great picture of John over there. So as our classes grew, um, we needed to bring in more instructors. Um, we started teaching, I think it was 14 classes each season. 
um, anywhere from beginner to intermediate. We never really got to the point that we were offering advanced classes. John was wonderful and taught a lot of our hand tools classes. I would teach a lot of uh, machine classes. Um, and we had spaces that we rented out in the shop. So the shop really grew. We went from 2,000 square feet in that first shop to 11,000 square feet in the second location that was in Providence, which I know some of you have, had been to at a point in time. Um, the other thing that happened at that point in time is I met my husband. Um, I had come out of a really bad relationship. I was boo-hooing the idea of dating. It was actually my employees who signed me up for Match.com. Um, you know, met this lovely guy on Match.com that said, I don't have time. I am building out a new shop. And if you are going to date, you got to help me build out the shop. So there's lots of wonderful pictures of him helping to tile the bathrooms at the shop and helping to paint the floors. Um, here's some of the pieces that were produced over the lifespan of, of Studio Done when we did furniture. We did we had 35 pieces um, at kind of the, the peak of our collection, all in a similar style, similar feel, a mix of um, handmade quality, but also uh, implementing CNC technology and digital fabrication in various ways as well. The best opportunities may be the ones you weren't looking for. Um, so very randomly, um, I had been wanting to get back into jewelry. I hadn't looked at it for years. I had actually pursued industrial design at RISD. That's something I left out. I applied to RISD for jewelry, learned that there was a field that focuses on problem solving what I really enjoyed about jewelry design um, and that field is industrial design. So I went through the industrial design program at RISD. Is that where you learned woodworking? Um, great question. So I actually learned woodworking from my dad in the basement. He had a little okay. hobbyist shop in the basement. My mom loves to tell the story where she came home when I was 18 months old and my dad was working on the house. He had nails in his in his mouth, taking a nail, you know, re-shingling the outside. She comes around the corner to the garage. She smiles at me. I smile at, smile back in a mouthful of nails. <laughs> and she was like, I can't leave you alone with him in the yeah. shop anymore. All right. <laughs> so that, they, they say that that was the beginning of my, my woodworking education. Um, so I got introduced to woodworking in the basement in my dad's shop. Um, my dad was a hobbyist. My grandfather was a hobbyist. Um, you know, my dad had always wanted to pursue furniture as a career, but ended up going into medicine. And so was very supportive when I showed an interest in furniture. Funny enough, though, I wanted nothing to do with what he was doing, you know, in high school, which is why I pursued jewelry. Um, applied to RISD for jewelry, realized I liked industrial design. In industrial design, one of the mandatory, you know, uh, major classes is intro to woodwork. Sure. Fell in love and pr pretty much did furniture design throughout uh, Misty. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I talked about that media attention I had gotten. I had a small piece in Delta's In Flight magazine. I, they had called, done an interview, had a little spiel on me. And the CEO of De Beers Diamond saw it. And they own several other companies. One is called Naledi. And they said, Naledi, one of our brands is struggling. We're looking to bring in a really different look. Um, I've seen your furniture. I had some of my initial jewelry pieces in the same article. And they were like, we'd really love to see what you can do for this brand. And so they brought me on and I designed 20 pieces for them. I was a bit older. I was a bit smarter. I did it for royalties. Um, <laughs> and this uh, uh, bangle or bracelet is one of the pieces I designed for them. They gave me the theme of Bohemian Interstellar. Okay. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> You know, and so it's like, what am I doing with that? So I came up with a whole collection for them. I didn't do the ring or the necklace, just the, the bangle here. What's that? The bangle works. Yeah, exactly. But to give you a sense of how I work when I work for other people is I take that theme or whatever kind of brief they give me and I put a bunch of different things in front of them to see what will catch. So I'll, I'll often do kind of a, a digital assembly of my drawings. These are all done in my sketchbook and then scanned in or photographed in and then I add some color in, in Photoshop or Illustrator. Um, I am not a fan of, well, it doesn't really show as magenta, but it's kind of a purpley magenta background, but it was one of their brand colors, which is a big deal. You always include the, the brand's brand colors in your presentation. So their brand colors were this magenta, the pink at the top, and then a gray line at the bottom. So just to kind of 
you know, a piece of a bit. Um, they went ahead and pursued, uh, we developed a collection of 20 pieces. Um, you know, when you develop for uh, another brand, it could be as simple as we want some sketches, or it could be as detailed as we want you to work with our factory to go ahead and figure out how they're actually made. And this was an instance, unlike the Crate and Barrel, where I just submitted drawings and prototypes, this was an instance where I actually worked with their factory. So I created factory drawings, went back and forth while they prototyped, critiqued the prototypes until it became a you know, fully fledged finished product line. Um, oddly enough, I have no background in branding, but they loved the work and asked if I would be interested in doing some branding work. So I also developed their or rebranded with them. Um, as well, and so their colors are no longer magenta, pink, and red. <laughs> <laughs> um, the difference between a problem and an opportunity is what to make of it. Um, so seven years ago now, um, my I had grown the business to twenty five thousand square feet and twelve employees, um, and my lead craftsperson decided that. He was going to leave the industry altogether. He was going to go into day trading, um, you know, um, and he gave me plenty of notice, but I had to figure out, was I going to go ahead and train somebody to run the shop or was this kind of the opportunity I was looking for to make a big change? I was stretched really thin. I was going ahead and running a furniture line, a lighting line, and the Kisei Studio wood shop and classes. Um, so I decided to go ahead and consolidate. We went ahead and closed Kisei Studio, the community wood shop. Um, I went ahead and let go of the uh, wood line of furniture and I focused exclusively on lighting. Um, it was the area that was most exciting and most challenging to me at the time, um, but also brings in a lot of elements of jewelry, which I'm still very fond to and find, find myself keep continuing to revisit, kind of like jewelry for the home. Um, you saw that initial piece I showed early on of the Cumberland light that pendant. Um, we also did a sconce version, which you see here. Um, we've developed, you know, a small but contemporary brand of pieces that we that we produce. Um, we primarily work in metalwork now, but have some wood pieces that complement it. Um, I want to talk a little bit about building codes because building codes come into play a lot with lighting design. Um, because you have to go ahead and meet building codes in order for your pieces to be installed in a lot of settings. And the building codes, there's standardized ones across the U.S., but then they vary state to state. So you have to have some knowledge as to the different areas. Um, we have a coverage that's called UL, Underwriters Laboratory. You've probably seen the UL mark on various electronic equipment. Um, they have these really long guidelines as to how to you know, appropriately and safely build various things. We have two licenses under them. Um, we have a license uh, to produce wall mounted and ceiling mounted fixtures, or what they call surface mount fixtures, and then a license to go ahead and produce portables, which is something that can be moved around and plugged into different sockets. It's not inexpensive to go ahead and pursue, um, but if you're looking at doing commercial work, most states require you out for commercial work. So at a certain point when the business grew to a certain size, and there's you're getting more interest in hospitality and restaurants and whatnot. We were in a position where we had to decline it or shop out the assembly to shops that could go ahead and do it. And so at a certain point for us, it made sense to go ahead and incorporate the UL coverage into our, our you know, uh, services. Um, the UL guidelines for the two licenses that we have, they each have a manual that's four to 500 pages long. Okay, and they have a whole training process and they require you to have certain equipment for testing that then you have to send out to get calibrated every year. And all in, it is a ten to fourteen thousand dollar a year investment to go ahead and have UL coverage. So you have to be of a certain scale to make it worthwhile. Now there are shops that go ahead and offer UL services. They have what's called general coverage, and they essentially receive, assemble, pack, and ship out other people's work. And we did that for quite a while before we brought coverage into our shop. Um, this is a chandelier that we've designed called the Sorrentia Quad. That's in context. Is that LED? Yes, LED bulbs. Um, we did start out with incandescent. We did about two, three years of incandescent before we decided to switch entirely to LED. 
Um, they're all LED bulbs, though. They're not onboard integrated LEDs because UL has a very high standard for integrated LEDs where you actually have to send out a fixture to get tested as kind of like the, the baseline that you're establishing. And you have to do that for each model type, and it adds up very quickly. And the infrastructure to go ahead and maintain and repair onboard LEDs. And, and for those who don't know, onboard LEDs means um, the bulb or the, the luminaire is uh, integrated right into the fixture. There's no way to remove a part of the fixture. The downside is if there's an issue with it, you have to replace the entire fixture. Um, and if that company went out of business, there's not necessarily, or if they discontinued that product, there's not necessarily a new lighting component you can put in. Um, what's that? It's all LEDs these days, yes. Exactly. <laughs> um, here it is in various contexts, uh, similar fixtures. Um, over here we have our linden table lamps, which we do in a couple different colors. And it's hard to see here, but we do a piece called Food Sconces. Um, there's our linden table lamp in the cream finish. Um, and something that we do is after we send out a product, because it's hard to stage photography like this, after we send out a product to a client, three-ish months later we reach out, do a little follow-up, um, you know, ask if they're going to photograph the project, and then often we'll license those images. It's much more affordable for us to license wonderful images than it is for my team to go ahead and stage something like this. And just the amount of labor and props and setup and the cost of a photographer compared to licensing an image. <laughs> licensing an image in the interior design industry is anywhere from $150 to $500 per image. Um, so it can get costly. So you have to be selective and thoughtful about which ones are really going to show off the work, which ones make sense for you to license. Um, more of our Serenthia light. Um, this was a great project on the left. This was a three-story penthouse apartment in Chicago. They wanted to go ahead and do a two to three-story chandelier. Um, and they had a they had windows at the top of the atrium. So they wanted to go ahead and feed the electrical through the frame of the windows mm -hmm. and have it mounted on very thin points. Um, so a couple things that come into play there. A is how are we going to mount it? B how do you get a three-story chandelier up to a penthouse apartment? So we went ahead and built this in components with instructions as to how to go ahead and put the different sections together so that the electrician on site could go ahead and assemble. In advance of sending it, we communicated with the electrician to make sure that they'd be capable of doing that and had the equipment and understood what was being done. Um, and this turned out you know, great in the end, but it, a lot of communication and coordinating to make it happen. And it's hard to see here, but on the right side, there's two of our Cumberland companies. Yeah. Do you have a patented or copyrighted when you make those? Great question. Um, copyrighted patent when it comes to design uh, is a tricky thing. Unless you're developing a brand new technology, you can absolutely copyright, but you have to have the money to be willing to take somebody to court for it. All right, so somebody, one, one of the best pieces of advice I got is if you don't have $150,000 sitting around to take somebody to court over it, is it really worth you pursuing it? Yeah. So my philosophy has been continue to regularly put out new designs because we know that it gets knocked off. It often gets knocked off internationally, so it would be very difficult to pursue anyways. So we have discontinued designs when it becomes commonplace in the market, and we keep developing new designs to hopefully yes. stay unique. Yep. There you go. <laughs> um, we did the sconces for this space. Some of the spaces, I mean, I am not the demographic that we sell to. I don't have a bathroom that size. <laughs> you know, it can be really interesting when these requests come in. And so, like, we did a closet for. I don't even remember who the client was. It was some celebrity, and it was like a 20 foot by 18 foot closet, but they wanted to do a chandelier that spanned the closet. And the chandelier quote was something like $14,000, and you're just like, this is for a closet. Um, but that is the industry I'm in. 
Um, but the most recent release that we put out is the Tetra Collection. Uh, this is inspired by 90s video games, specifically Tetris. But for copyright reasons, I can't say that in, in our you know press stuff. Um, but I grew up with Tetris. I grew up loving Tetris, playing with it all the time. I draw Tetris-like stuff in my sketchbook all the time and had finally you know, wanted to develop a collection around it. We've done a lot of really organic work, so this is kind of a different side or a different perspective of what we're able to do. Um, this has had great response. Usually we don't see response to a new product for three to four months. Um, the reason being is that we get it out there, and then the client or the interior designer finds it. They include it in a presentation either to their interior designer or the interior designer to the client. You know, it goes back and forth while decisions get made, and then we don't hear from them until they're actually ready to pursue it. Um, so this was great because we saw almost instantaneous response with this. The other thing that we did side by side to make ourselves stand out is that we released the ability to do all of our fixtures in 180 different colors. We work closely with a powder coder here in Rhode Island um, that can do custom colors at a really approachable cost. Um, so now we can go ahead and do custom colors for all our fixtures, and that's been a huge sales point for us. Um, yeah. You can show more of your pictures with the white. Um, I noticed that one was on the most of the part. Yeah, great question. That's not by our choice because that's the interior designers who shoot it that way. Um, yeah. A lot of times they're trying to get the best possible photo. Sometimes having the artificial light in that space versus natural light can really skew what they're looking to focus on or to get a focus on the whole room instead of the lighting. So that's not necessarily our choice. In most of our photography, not all, but you'll notice most we do show the light on. Because for us, that's part of the selling point. What kind of light does it project? Yeah. Oh, great question. How deep do you want me to get into that? Um, so something I do at the beginning of any design process, and here we'll turn the drawings for that, um, is a speculative market analysis. And what that means is I go ahead and I plot out a chart where I look at the price of the product um, on the market, not my products, but other people's products who are comparable, and then the costs that I think it would be for me to produce it. So I'm reverse engineering other people's products. And I plot that out on a chart. And what that tells me is where the clusters fall. Okay, if there's somebody way down here, they're underpricing their product. If there's somebody way up here, they're the anomaly. They came up through the range and made a big name for themselves, and you're buying it because of the name more than the product, usually. Then you find that cluster. All that chart is for is for me to understand what kind of price range I feel comfortable in, you know, producing a product in. And then I reverse engineer what, if I pursue or design a new piece, what do I have to be able to produce it for in order to meet that price point? You see too many people going ahead and developing a product that they're excited about, and then they get it to market, and it just blows everything out of the water in terms of like way overpriced for what the market can go ahead and support. Um, so that's very tricky. It's limiting because there's definitely a design refinement that has to happen based on that price point. And sometimes I'll have a detail I love that I have to give up because we're trying to be a certain price point. Um, we do batch production. So we don't do hundreds of something. We do 10 to 15 of something at a time. So we're not taking a huge amount of risk. Obviously, there is risk involved because um, we're not producing nothing, but we're you know doing it in a very calculated way. Um, we also use rendering to go ahead and help us convey things in other finishes and colors. So sometimes we'll produce something in one finish, but each style that we're going to release, and then we'll bring it into another program to go ahead and Photoshop or render it to, to give it the look of other finishes. Um, because we want to show the context and capability, but we don't necessarily have the budget to do five different fixtures and five different finishes. Um, in our most recent release, where we showed uh, you know, that we can do 180 colors, I think we chose a palette of five or six colors. And we did those in renderings. You know, we took pictures, we brought it into the, the computer, changed the colors. Um, and that was a huge success because we got immediate response saying, hey, can you do it in this color? Absolutely. Let's make that happen. You know, they saw a context, they were like, oh, you can do colors now? I want a color for this project. Mm -hmm. um, I don't always agree with their color choices, but <laughs> we can do 180 colors. Um, 
So this gives you a sense of what my sketchbook looks like. Um, I'm sketching constantly, lots of different things going on. This was the idea for kind of a pleated shade that I'm playing with. Um, from, go ahead. A quick question. You talked about working with small batch bins and turnover of um, designs that were the run ahead of the patent knockoff situation. Yeah. Your products are, are fine art, but they're also durable goods. So what happens when your long-term customer needs you to fix that LED or whatever light that is yep. now no longer in production? Is that difficult to do it? It, we've been very fortunate that we have we built a high quality product and have not run into that often. Okay. Um, and in the rare case that we do, often we keep a small batch of inventory of retired stuff so that we can address that exact issue. Okay. Yeah. Um, in fact, one of the shade fabrics that we used, um, they discontinued that particular fabric because we sell a light fixture that has a top shade and a body that's made out of the same, same shade material. If one or the other gets damaged, they want a replacement that matches. And so we had for a while 20 or 30 spare shades when we had to switch fabrics because um, we knew it would come up. We knew people would reach out. We just had somebody reach out recently, their, you know, their young child went ahead and took a marker to a shade and they needed a shade replacement. And luckily, we have a box with that particular color set and you're able to send them a replacement shade. Or you offer to mark the other one. <laughs> exactly. Um, on occasion, when it's a great customer, we've had a really good experience with them before, and something like that will come up. It gives us the opportunity to be the hero too. You know, we can go ahead and say, "Oh yeah, we'll, we'll do that. Let's do a twenty percent discount. Let's show them that we can save the day. We'll, we'll stick in their mind next time they have a project." Um, most of our customers, look here, I'll, I'll spell this out. One percent of our customer, one percent, is direct to the final user. And very few homeowners are actually purchasing from us. 70% of our business is to the trade. So that's interior designers and architects. And so for us, that's repeat this business. If they had a good experience with us, they're going to use our work on other projects. And 30% of our business is wholesale. So we sell to 12 different retailers that carry our work across the U.S. Because we sell a high cost product and people often like to see it in person. But it can be hard to sell something if people can't go visit it somewhere and experience it somewhere. Um, so back to sketches. So these are some sketches for a pleated design. Um, often going straight from my sketchbook, I'll go ahead and sample it in some material. This is chipboard. Um, chipboard is the same material that cereal boxes are made out of. So we can go ahead and, and map it on the chipboard, play with it, try it out, you know, see it in different scale. Uh, you can see our little shop dog over here sleeping. Um, and then at a certain point, we'll transition to the final material. So the idea of a pleated shade is not a brand new idea. Pleated shades are a historical um, context uh, going back as far as lay lamps in France. Um, what is unique is the application to be able to put something in a damp or wet setting that can go ahead and last, that has this aesthetic. Um, shades that are pleated that are made out of shade material will mold in a lot of settings that are damp. And so if you want something more durable that can be used in a hospitality setting, that can be used in a kitchen, in a commercial or restaurant setting, in a bathroom even, that's where we've seen kind of this niche and this opportunity to bring that aesthetic to that space. Um, in addition, we've added, it's hard to see in these, but in the next couple of images you'll see, We've added a curved cutaway on the bottom and top of each piece, too. So it's not just pleated, but there's an interesting contour as well. Um, I'll pass around the pieces that I brought. Even though you prototype a lot, you rely on CAD for most everything, right? So that's a great question. So I really love a hands on process. I start with a hands on process. I know, start process. with your schedule. Yes. Um, but even the initial uh, cardboard models will often go ahead and be, you know, done by hand. In this case, it was a repetitive shape, so I brought it into a vector program. But with every product at a certain stage, it does go into CAD for us. Um, whether it's for manufacturing purposes or because our industry is now using rendering so heavily yeah. that our clients say, can you send us an yeah. STL file of that piece so I can include it in the rendering for the client? And so we have to have that on hand for them sure. to make the sale. Um, so you can pass this around. These are, this is one of the modules. 
Um, these designs are made out of, here I'll go back to slide. Um, these designs are made out of repeat modules. And so essentially a, a two to four fold unit. Um, we use a company called Sen Cut Sen. Um, they've got two or three locations across the country now. It's a company that we can send a component to. They can laser cut it out of metal. They have the ability to go ahead and fold it into different forms. They can also do press fits, which are essentially a nut or a stud that's pressed into the metal rather than welded into the metal. Okay, so you'll see press fits are on that piece I'm passing around. Yeah. Cool, right? <laughs> um, we do a lot of iterations, so going ahead and playing with things at a lot of different scales, um, just seeing what we can come up with and what's going to be most attractive. And at a certain point, we turn it into a collection. So this particular collection we're going to release with three shades. That back one that's tall, this front one that's wide, and then the one directly to the right of this uh, large one are going to be the three that we're going to release this collection in. We're going to show it in different colors because this is a great opportunity to promote the fact that we can do it in lots of different colors. And the name of this collection that we proposed is the Scala, um, which is the root for scallop, which is where the initial inspiration actually started for this collection, the texture on a scallop shell. Um, I brought in some process stuff to hand around because I know that this is a crowd that always appreciates how things are made. Um, so our glass pieces are blown. We start out a lot of our designs to see scale. Um, if it's going to be an expensive process like this to produce, we'll start out with an inexpensive process like 3D printing. So I'll pass this around. This is a 3D printed version of this. The initial version, and it's hard to tell from the image, but the mouth of this part here is narrower than the mouth here. This is actually a second evolution of this product because it's so narrow, it's hard to replace the bulb, and we wanted to make it an easier experience for somebody to go ahead and change out that bulb. We've actually redesigned this product, the third uh, version, where the whole shade just comes off, and you can go ahead and change the bulb and put the whole shade back on. So we've actually gone a bit narrower, back to the narrower, because aesthetically we like the narrower more. Um, when it's blown in the mold, it looks like this. It's got kind of this top part on it that has to get cut off. Okay, and then they go ahead and they cut that top part off. This is a reject. This has some chips in it. This was an experiment that we did to actually do a side hole, because we were, we were playing with the idea of doing a small little uh, bedside or table lamp at a certain point. Uh, we, I think we did a limited run of them, but we weren't happy with how they turned out, so we didn't pursue that long term. Um, but they'll cut, cut the top of that glass part off, um, then we'll go ahead and we'll grind it on a whetstone um, to go ahead and treat that surface um, and give it a little bit of a chamfer as well. Um, oh, I've got the full mold here too. Me, I did bring woodwork. <laughs> Um, okay, so this is an old mold. This is a glass blowing mold. It's got two parts that get closed, and then they blow the glass into it. Um, it's a bit heavy. I'll leave it up here. Everyone's welcome to come see it afterwards, um, but it's a little bit weighty to pass around. Um, we have a resource where we get green timber from. This is cherry. It's green. Uh, initially, it's green, so that means it's still wet. Um, we go ahead and we CNC. Okay, so, so computer numerical coded routing um, the inside away. Um, and then they'll go ahead and keep it soaked so it stays wet. They add a little bit of bleach so it doesn't get moldy over time. Um, when they're ready to, to blow mold some of our pieces, they pop it out. Um, they'll get whatever color ready. They blow into the mold. And two things to consider. Um, one is you want the mold to be wet because it produces a steam when the glass touches it that prevents the glass from sticking to the mold. That's why it's so important that it stays wet. The second is, any ideas why it's made out of cherry? <laughs> That's why. No, I'm <laughs> Any idea why it's made out of cherry? High grain. High grain. Density. What's that? The density. Density? Not quite. Moisture time. The no? expansion, contraction. No, no. You're missing one. What kind of tree is a cherry tree? What does it bear? Fruit. Fruit. So there's a lot of what in the wood structure? Sugars. 
Exactly. Sugars self-heal the wood when it gets hot. They get brought to the surface. And so the molds actually last longer when they're made out of food tree wood. Exactly. Because the sugars in it go ahead and emulsify under the heat and the water, and then they get sucked towards the surface. So the molds will last for 250 blows instead of 150 to 200. So that's why you most commonly see it made out of fruit wood. Not always cherry, but fruit wood. Exactly. Yeah, right? Cool little piece of knowledge. Um, all right, so the Sorenthia light, that real linear branch like one, um, that has an adjustable joint on it. So you can go ahead and angle those arms at lots of different positions. For that process, we started with a clay model that then we took into CAD. And once we had the CAD model, we had it printed in aluminum or, or CNC routed in aluminum. That gave us a master. We took that master to Harrison Casting and they made a vulcanized rubber mold. So now they have a mold that they can inject wax into. They take those waxes out, they attach it to a tree like I was describing, put that whole thing in plaster, melt out the wax, pour in the metal, and then we've got our castings. Okay, so I will pass these around. Here is the original aluminum piece that they use as the master. Um, I'll start this one at the other side. This is what the casting looks like when it comes out. I'll go back to the other side, and this is what it looks like when they face the end, which is mean, they mean uh, machine these perpendicular and flat, uh, drill them, tap them, and we've sent this to already have initial satin. So they've already given it the first, the first kind of texturing of the surface. It's not completely done yet, but it's getting pretty close to being done. Um, we have those done usually in a batch of 150. Um, what we'll do is we'll have a batch of 150 of the raw castings, a batch of 150 of the machine ones, and a batch of 150 of the, the satin pieces. When we run out of one, the next one goes to the next machinist for the next process. So they keep getting pulled down the line to the next process, but we always kind of have them. Uh, in stock. This is one of our most popular products. So we're moving this one regularly enough that we've grown it to a point that we do 150 at a time. We would never come right out of the gate with 150 of something. That's built on the knowledge we've gained of what our sales look like. So are these available in different colors too? They are. They can be powder coated. Yeah. Um, so we do use three. For that? We'll, we'll uh, yes and no. So we do three metal finishes. So we do a brass finish, we do a nickel finish, and we do an oil rub brass finish like a patina. Mm -hmm. And that's our more expensive line. And then we do the powder coat, which is more approachable. Um, we don't do the aluminum for that because aluminum casting can warp a lot and it can be costly to do. So we still do the same brass castings wow. for that. Yeah, it still makes sense for us. For the failure rate being so high for aluminum, it wasn't worth us pursuing that. The next step for that piece, if we get to a point where the quantity makes sense, would be die casting, which is where you have a metal mold and you cast the metal right into that metal. Um, so this is another part or product we haven't released yet. This is done by Send Cut Send. Um, this is what the piece looks like when they laser cut it. This is what the piece looks like when they do all the folds for this part. I'll pass those around so you can see. And these are just our samples, so don't worry about damaging them. It won't get the, you know, if they get scratched and whatnot, I'm anticipating that. <laughs> um, this is for a product we haven't released yet. Uh, we've been developing it for a year and a half, I want to say, and we keep having like little refinements that we keep doing it, minor changes that you know, in the grand scheme of things, will matter. Um, this was an interesting one. So these are the, the fluted part of that branch chandelier that I was showing on either end right before the bulb. Um, you know, we've 3D printed it. That's how we initially prototyped that one. Um, but funny enough, my very first prototype of that was cutting off the plastic end of a cham disposable champagne glass. Okay, that was kind of the inspiration for that shape. I really liked that shape. It was a nice scale. I played with that, incorporated that and then did a 3D print of it. I really wanted it to be solid brass. Um, so I played with casting and that did not work. Um, casting does not like really thin wall thicknesses. The, 
this is an example of that. This is a failed casting. I'll pass this around. I have lots of pits and issues. Um, but quickly, uh, proof of concept that this was not a great way to go ahead and pursue this. Um, yeah? What is that? Yeah. Um, that will become a table lamp. No, no, no. Hand me, hand me the black piece. I'll describe it. All right. Top secret stuff, guys. Um, this will become a table lamp that has a shape, a square shade for the base and two tall shades on either side. These parts here are going to hold the socket so that there'll be a light inside each of those two shades. As we are developing it and once we illuminated it, we thought that there'd be some residual or escaped light that went into the bottom shade. It's not enough to illuminate it to our liking. So it looks like something's wrong. Like it should illuminate, but it doesn't. So that's how we've refined this. So this is an older prototype. Now we've actually incorporated another bulb that faces the other way to the base. I don't know where along the way this goes. Um, how do we make these now? So these are actually spun parts. Okay, you guys know what spinning is? Raise your hand if you don't know what spinning is. Okay, great, spinning. So spinning is a technique where you make a wood or metal mold that goes on a lathe. And then you take a disc of metal and, and pinch it between the lathe and that mold. And as the metal and the, the mold spin, you force the metal over that mold. Okay, you're actually stretching the metal out over that mold. It's how they do a lot of different lampshades. How they make symbols, how they make a lot of different lampshades. It's a, you know, there's a, uh, how they make mixing bowls. If you have a metal mixing bowl, sometimes they make it that way. Um, the tricky thing is they don't want to do shapes like this because the further you bring it down, the more they have to anneal it or the more molds they need because they can't just do it in one stage and bring it all the way down. You'll get kind of a, a crimping effect. Um, so for this particular piece, they do it in three or four molds. So they go ahead and bring it down over one mold, they switch it to the next mold, bring it down further, you know, switch to the next one. At a certain point, I said to, to our spinner, could you start with a pipe? Would that make it easier? And he loved that idea. No one had ever suggested that for spinning. He's like, I think we could make that happen. So now they actually start with a piece of two. And so they just have to spin down the skinnier side and do a little lip on that. And so it's one process instead of multiple processes. And that cut this piece down in, I think it's almost a third the cost that it was when they had to do, you know, multiples of it. Did I pass this around yet? Okay, so for the bases of the Linden lamp, and excuse the rough shape of these, these are you know, just in shop prototype parts. Um, we were initially going ahead and turning these, okay? So that's why it's got three holes on here. We threw a base plate on, we pop it on, we turned it, we turned the inside, we pop it off, we sand it, whatnot. Um, we decided that there was a lot more efficiency we could gain going ahead and producing these without having to turn them necessarily. So we actually switched to doing them on the CNC. And the other issue we were running into is every now and again we'd get a client that would call us saying that the post that comes up from this was getting loose. And so we wanted to go ahead and create some kind of registration so that when we tightened it down, it wasn't something that could spin in here. And so we introduced a square or rectangular washer in there. So everything gets clamped to this rectangular washer. The washer can't spin, it's in a rectangular cavity. Um, that's the washer. And so this is just a very simple galvanized steel laser cut piece, you know, custom made washer that fits in here. Everything gets clamped to that. Um, this is done on the CNC, but then we throw it on the lathe for all the finishing sanding and finishing work. Um, this you'll see is just a beat up prototype piece. What's that? No, walnut. Yeah, walnut. So this is the uh, General's uh, spray, spray polyurethane. General as in the General uh, company brand. All right, this is Osmo. Um, if you're into finishing, Osmo is getting used more and more for production. Um, it's really nice in the way that it dries. It doesn't show lips as easily as a lot of other finishes. It incorporates into itself really well and it builds up very quickly. So, no, the Osmo, we use a hand apply. We were using a spray for this one. Yeah, we, we used to use a gen, the general polyurethane early on um, and then switched to the Osmo at a certain point. 
How does you well feel about your wood basis? What's that? You well and wood basis. Completely fine. Where the issue is with something combusting is its closeness to the bulb, not actually its closeness to the wires. Um, the wires are all insulated, so they don't have a, a high chance of coming in contact with the wood itself. But if I were to put a bulb within an inch, one and an eighth, I believe, in this circumstance, um, then it becomes a combustibility risk where it could singe or catch fire or, or even just smoke, even if it wasn't going to catch, but that's where it comes from. Yeah, good question. Um, this is a bracket for that long linear canopy that holds those branch-like fixtures. This is an internal component that a nice, you know, high polish piece goes over. Um, but similar to the, the uh, lamp base, I needed some registration so that those posts can't spin freely because one of the advantages of the fixture is that you can rotate it into whatever you know, orientation you want. But I want it to rotate down here at the rotation point, and I don't want it to rotate up here, because then there's a chance that the wires could go ahead and get wound up and there could be a short. So I needed to find a way to go ahead and, and stabilize that. They needed to do it inexpensively, because we were already at our max cost for where we wanted to be for this particular product. So we were playing with ideas of, could you screw a flange for this that was threaded? Could we go ahead and tap this, um, but it's not necessarily thick enough for the tap size we needed. You know, lots of little complications that came up along the way. So the fun solution we came up with is an off-the-shelf threaded nut. Um, looks just like that over there. We went ahead and took it to our machinist who machined away a small shelf all the way around and gave it kind of a square registration. That square registration now fits into this square hole here. So when we screw into it from below and, we, and you lock it in place, it can't rotate, okay? Because it's got that registration there. It's a dollar for this piece. It's a dollar to have it machines. This was a $2 solution, okay? That makes me very happy when we're already at the top of our production cost and can't spend a small fortune to come up with a solution. And many of the fixtures will have multiples of so we needed something that you know was approachable from a cost standpoint. Most solutions are not that cheap. That one I brought in because it's so exciting that we got it down to a two dollar solution. That's very rare. Um, I think we're close to the end of these. Um, we produced a lamp that we released last year called the Pillaret Table Lamp. Um, it's got three columns that go up, and then it's got a shade at the top. Um, it's capped with two metal pieces, and right now we've released it with a wood clover shape in the middle. But we also want to be able to add it to our 180 color options, so we need an option that can be powder coated. Um, so what we came up with is doing it in aluminum. Um, we've gone ahead and made a master out of 3D printing. Um, we went ahead and sent this. This is not the finished master. You actually have to scale it up because you get shrinkage in casting. Um, so this was to go ahead and see the scale and make sure it would work. We had a second one of these made that was 7 or 8% larger, and that one went to the foundry that goes ahead and cast aluminum for us. Um, they went ahead and cast it, sent the casting back. It's perfect for our needs. We can easily surface this outside with very little work. Um, and powder coat will even cover up a good amount of the scratches. So we don't need this exterior face like that. perfect. We just need it to be relatively smooth, like the, any high points or low points that are going to be significant. So we can then send this to our powder coater, and then we'll be able to go ahead and offer colors. Um, the little bumps that are there, those are actually for little felt feet later. Um, so there's a place to accept those little feet on the underside of the design. I think this is my last slide. Um, this is part of the Linden table lamp, uh, the table lamp that has the two shades. We didn't want to have just an exposed brass socket. That's just a very standard thing, and we want it to feel very luxury, very different. So we went ahead and gave it this cone look. Um, the socket uh, switch here passes through that hole there. So the socket still lives inside this. Um, but something that arose while making this 
was this little complication, which is this screw here. We need to tighten that to the rod that comes up from the base, and so we need to access it. Yes, we could get in there with an L-shaped thing, but we can't really see it. It was very difficult. So in the end, we decided that an okay compromise was to add a little hole down here on the back. As we were designing it, we all hated that solution. We were like, this is just a, you know, going to be a blaring issue. It's like, why is it there? And of course, when we actually install it in the piece, the trim of the shade below it comes up just high enough that it hides it. So something that we put a lot of energy and headache and thought into got hidden anyway. So it's an easy solution to a problem, you know, to go ahead and make this much more easy to assemble. Is that a commercial bulb fixture on the right? Great question. So if you're interested in, in making lighting, a great resource is Grand Brass Lamp Parts out of Connecticut. Um, they have tons of lighting components. They do a lot of proprietary lighting components too. So this is one that they produce. You can actually see their stamp there, Grand Brass Lamp Parts, GBLP. Um, but they have a huge catalog of components. Um, very reasonable price-wise. This is, um, it's the stem and the brass knob that makes the special. This part? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Those are the key. That's called the a key. key. Yeah. It, they actually do a version that's threaded so you can change it too. Wow. So they have like five or six, six different versions. I don't wear from a very you know, uh, uh, traditional look to a very contemporary look. It makes and, it so much luxurious, more luxurious yeah. than plastic. Yeah, people love that little okay. bit of it. Yeah. We actually had a stamp made and now we stamp done into the switch, into the face of it too. Um, something I really like about this company too is that they will do some custom things, but they'll do it for a production approach. So for instance, um, when you attach a sconce to the wall, you usually attach it with two small finials that, that attach to two threaded screws coming off your junction box. All that they have is these very traditional looking finials. And so I reached out when I saw a contemporary because I said, you just do a very simple cylinder. Brass cylinder, very clean, with a tiny chamfer on the front edge. And they thought it was great. They went ahead and produced it and reached out to us saying, it's one of our best sellers now. You know, this little tiny piece of hardware that was 10 cents each and they sell, sell a ton of them. So, no, no, no. But that's because I, you know, I had a need and I saw an opportunity to have it done cheaper than using my machinist. Now, our machinist is great, but he's going to charge more for stuff like that than a place that's going to go ahead and do it at much larger quantity and can see an opportunity to sell it to other clients. But I love seeing other people's work when it's incorporated because it's like, I did that. <laughs> that was all me. Um, yeah, I think that was my last slide. That's everything. Yes. Actually, one thing that I always had problems with is IKEA lamps. Is you buy one of these things, and then the bulb would go out, and go back and try to get the bulb. They don't make that bulb in here. <laughs> so, what is the opposite lessons for all sizes and bases? Yeah, great question. So, the most common and consistent bulb sockets are E26 and E12. Um, E26 is kind of the standard every day. It's the socket that I'm passing around. That's the most common size in the U.S. The E12 is known as the candelabra size. But those have been around. They keep staying around. Um, but the technology is moving and changing so quickly that it can be rough because you can buy something that has a unique socket size and a unique bulb, and a couple of years later, it doesn't exist anymore. There's a perfect example in California. So California is trying to outlaw incandescent bulbs. Okay. Um, what they found through surveys, not through inspections, was that people were going ahead and taking out their incandescent bulbs, putting in LEDs for inspection, and then switching it back. <laughs> and it wasn't working. Right. So they created a two-pin type socket. It goes in and then it twists. You may have come across it. What's that? Twist lock. Yeah, twist lock. Exactly. Um, but it terribly angered people because there's not a ton of bulbs available for it. So they started to mandate the use of it. They started implementing this, and nobody was going ahead and adopting it. And you know, they had inspections that were failing right and left because nobody would want to go ahead and use it. So it is something that's still kind of you know trying to figure out where is that sweet spot for the way this technology is developing. Um, it used to be that there was standard size for the not the socket but the bulb shapes too. But because
because there's so much discovery in LEDs and LED bulb shapes, that's expanding as well. And you can buy something one day that doesn't exist the next. Um, a great example of a company that has succeeded in really unique bulb sizes is um, Tala, T-A-L-A. They've come up with some really unique bulb shapes, some really large and unusual shapes, um, and they've been able to go ahead and sustain it and stick around for a number of years. Um, and part of it is that they use different vendors to go ahead and produce it, and they have it custom produced by those vendors. And if that vendor goes under, they own all the molds, so they take it to another place. And I think that's key. They're not just reaching out to have a service provided, but they own all the tooling for it too. Um, but it's hard. And, and even with our linear bulbs, which are an off-the-shelf bulb, we've run into a number of places that have gone under. And even though we can get the same bulb shape, sometimes the exposed filament are different in size or a slightly different color. And so it's definitely tricky to navigate. Yes? Um, Get into this for a while, and so it's really interesting. But in the concept, LED lighting is always low voltage, it will transform into Yes. And so, if you wanted to have a strip of lighting, you could use other capital lights, but that's like an LED every three inches yep, yep. with an inverter. Yep. Do you have a solution that you use where you can bring in 120 volts and have a one foot long? sort of continually luminescent, you know what I mean? Yeah, great like, uh, question. So that's integrated. That's the area that we don't generally get in all that often. Um, but I do teach a fair amount of it, so I have knowledgeable on that area. Um, so to go ahead and kind of repeat what you were saying, if you're using LED technology that's low voltage, you need some kind of power converter to go from the energy that's coming out of your wall down to low voltage. Um, there's a variety of different shapes and sizes. They have ones that are what's called external mount, so it's external from a junction box. Then they have internal mount, these small ones that fit inside a junction box. So you can mount them inside the junction box, inside the wall, so they're not taking up external, you know. Um, and then they have on-board one, which is a circuit board built into the luminaire that actually adjusts that voltage. Um, in LED bulbs, if you actually, I wish I brought an LED bulb. Um, <laughs> in an LED bulb, if you look inside the glass, way down at the bottom, you'll notice that most of them have a little chip, a little circuit board there. They actually go ahead and make that step down, either through a resistor or a wavelength uh, modifier. Um, there's a variety of different ways they can do it. Um, it a lot of it's going to depend on, A, how much energy is required for your particular strip. Okay, because the amount of energy that's, that's needed for your particular strip dictates the size of that transformer. If it has a lot of demand, then it's going to have a larger converter. If it has very little demand, you can get away with these smaller and smaller and smaller sizes. Um, in fact, what our computers run on low, low voltage, this is a transformer. You know, we don't think about it every day, it's just there, but these things on our computers are a transformer as well. Um, and they have some that are right at the source. So this right here, this is a transformer. Okay, real small transformer. Um, if you reach out to me, I can give you some websites. There's a variety of places that you can go ahead and buy the supplies for exactly what you're looking for. Um, the other thing I want to touch on related to that is when you use these ribbons that have LEDs every so often, and you can get them every half inch, one inch, two inch, three inch. Um, if you light it up just like that, we call those hot spots. You know, they're each individually very bright. It doesn't look like a consistent line. They have little aluminum housings with diffusers you can put on them. And the diffusers stand a certain distance away from those hot spots to help go ahead and homogenize that look so it looks like a single line instead of those hot spots. So there's a lot of sources for those aluminum housings as well. My follow-up is just, if you have a, I think everyone would appreciate it because I'm just being this LED. It's like, oh, it's blue. Oh, it's yellow. Is there a one that you can Great question. Yes. Okay. So within lighting, there's a huge range. The most common range of color temperature, also known as Kelvin, um, is between 2,000 to 5,000. 2,000 is very red. 5,000 is very blue. We find that for cozier spaces, most of our clients like the 2,700 to 3,000 range. And for more task-oriented spaces where you want 
a brighter light, a little bit more uplift of that blue in the 4,000 range, they'll tend to leave. 5,000 is very bright blue. It starts to feel sterile like a hospital. Yeah. Yeah. So with all the iterations that you've gone through, what staffing are you running at this point? Yeah, great question. So I had 12 at the peak of things. Um, something I don't think I mentioned is when I was stretched in so many directions, I felt more like a manufacturer than a designer. So that was another thing that contributed towards me going exclusively light. I downsized my team. I have four employees now. I teach in the industrial design department at RISD full time. This is my, I've taught 10 years part time. This is my first year full time. Um, and it's been a great opportunity for my team to take more leadership opportunity and to see can I juggle the two side by side. Um, something I love, and one of the reasons I agree to stuff like this, um, is that I love to see the Glimmer in people's eyes when they learn new things. That excitement, um, whether it's teaching a skill, whether it's talking about technology, and I don't think that I would like to run my studio without the teaching, or do the teaching without my studio. So for me, they go hand in hand. You know, they they borrow or lend creative energy to each other. Yeah. Yeah. So going back to your wood days and done a studio. Yeah. The chair. Then one of the very first pictures that showed the you know the, the the shaping of the bottom of the chair. So, like, I remember all those blanks. <laughs> um, so, I'm curious then, since you gave that up, whatever happened to that, to all the, the woodworking aspect and all that, did you sell it off? Is it, did it just kind of disappear? No, I mean, we, we finished out kind of the inventory we had. So, we didn't drop things completely, but we kind of took them off the site, our website, as they sold out. We didn't just like stop woodwork one day. Um, and then we kind of moved it over to what we call the seconds part of our website, you know, kind of trying to sell things that we still have around, but we're not really marketing. Um, we don't have inventory anymore. I get asked, we get, it's amazing how many people actually will approach us, specifically about our stools. Our stools were a big seller for us. Um, and we'll get asked regularly about it. We, we don't produce it anymore. It's not something I'm interested in pursuing. And there's a number of things that have come up since that are kind of versions of it, you know, so it's not something I'd want to really buy that. Um, but I take that energy to RISD in a lot of ways. So I teach wood two. Um, so all students in the industrial design department are required to take wood one, which is more hand tools oriented, and then introduction to woodwork. And then wood two is machinery. I love teaching machinery. I teach the incoming grad students a shop orientation class. And then I teach the chair design class in the industrial design yeah, exactly. So that's where that energy gets gets funneled into now, and I love just seeing what they can come up to. And often I'll start with putting examples out there, you know, where I started and what I did. Um, they crave to know what they're learning and how it applies to the real world. Um, especially this generation has so much anxiety about what comes next um, and what they're going to do with this education. That I think seeing those opportunities and what you can do with it. It's huge. But I know I think we've possibly even through here and had people that have shown stuff that and I, I remember I, I had a couple of cases, a couple of people that we've seen furniture in, in, in including chairs that said they went or they they did it while oh, they yeah. were at <laughs> which means they were probably your student, very possibly your students. Yeah. It depends if they were in the industrial design department yeah. where we teach more for market orientation or if they went to the furniture department. And I don't have any association. You know, I have a lot of friends in the furniture department, but I don't teach through that department. So it depends what department they went to. But um, it's, uh, it's really exciting at this point in my life to see how many people have passed through my teaching and where they are and what they've done. What they're up to now. Yeah. It's, it's fun to run into an old student and one that I had as a student 23 years ago. Yeah. Who yeah. came to me to get some work done. Isn't that amazing? It's an exciting we moment. Yeah. And it was like, oh, yeah. that, you know, where we were from and backgrounds and whatnot. Next thing I know, it's like, wait a second. You were one of my students 23 years ago. I had an intern that reached out to me last week. He's now working at MIT Fab Lab. And he said that the uh, the summer he interned for me was better education than the three years he had at, I think it was Rexley or whatever. 
She's like, that warms my heart. What an exciting kind of moment in email. 